Warburg. Mm, that too, yeah. I don't, guess I, know who, I don't guess I know who he is. I can't, like, picture He's the tall guy voice. that dated Elaine for a while in Seinfeld that's got the real deep voice. He was on, uh, uh, that, he, he's been on, he was the voice in Emperor's New Groove, the deep voice of his. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, he, I know, he, he, he also voiced the tick. Yes. Mm. Well, yeah, he was the actor. He was the actor, yeah, yeah uh, um, that played yeah. the tick. Okay, I know who you're talking about now, yeah. yeah. Okay, that took hey, his voice is instantly recognizable yes. when you yeah. hear it. Hello, citizens. <laughs> um, Another show I need to finish watching. Oh God, I love the tick. It was amazing. I'm caught up on Titans. Are you? Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I want I want to see Matt's reaction to this in in real time. So, the other day, Matt texted Craig and I and was just like, "Hey, you know, they sent screeners out." Uh, to people in Italy for the new Dune movie and it's amazing um, and he was super excited about it that afternoon I go to the comic shop and I'm picking up my books from Tony and Tony's telling me the same thing and he's super excited about it I get on my little group chat with the comic book bears and they're super excited about it not five minutes later Variety <laughs> publishes an article just trashing it <laughs> I don't listen to any yeah no but wow but, yeah, how, yeah. How, did you, how trashing did you it how did I, I, did, have you not seen that yet Oh yeah, no. So Variety magazine put out a um, put out an article. Just just I, I didn't actually read the entire thing. I just saw the actual where they had done it. Um, it was either Variety or Vanity Fair. It was one of the V magazines. But yeah, they just probably uh, Vanity Fair. I've not seen a negative. I've not seen anything negative about it yet. I don't. Well, here's the thing: critics have no real idea on yeah. what makes a good fantasy movie, anyways. No, so yeah, look that up, and I'm curious to see what you think about. It. Now, I mean, I know what I think about it, and what I think about it is I just don't give a shit. Um, like what I, they say? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm still like, not everything I've itself. seen. Everything I've seen looks amazing. I'm super excited about it. But it was just interesting that the same day that they did the screeners, where just like average people, like in Italy, went and saw it. Although, mm-hmm. can you really touch, trust the Italians? I mean, Mussolini. They, eh. But so, <laughs> they know I, art. I, brother. I, they I do, cannot they do know second art. this. <laughs> they, they do. They do know art and wine. They know art and which wine is art. So you know, and coffee. And mm. coffee. They Actually, pretty no, much invented coffee. Just scratch that. Like, we're going to go with the Italians from here. As long as there's not dictators. No. As long as there's not dictators from here on out. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. Um, no, definitely not. So, we'll, we'll stick with that. But it's, uh, no, I just thought that was interesting. So, the same day I saw those two things. Um, I'm just calling bullshit on it, though. I mean, by that same logic, we would have to hold Germans still accountable for. Oh, I do. Forces. This is a really bad uh, trail we're going down. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about Dune. Um <laughs> But no, so I'm speaking of movies, I'm a, I think we're going to go see the new Shang-Chi movie on Wednesday. Kind of super excited about that. Um, I have heard nothing but good things about this film. Same. Um, I'm, I'm haven't went and seen it yet, but I've heard nothing but positive. Yeah. I just, uh, I still have just this anxiety about going to theaters. I I don't know why, because I know like if I go in the middle of the afternoon, probably no one's going to be there. But I mean, I get why you have anxiety about it. I don't think it's a bad thing. Makes to have plenty of sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. I mean, ro- like we're doing just what you said. Like Roger and I are going to like a an afternoon. Yeah, Wednesday showing. afternoon. Yeah. There's probably going to be no one there. But so I mean, we're strict because we, we've been to a. You few hear movies. this right? He has a chance to come to Kapow this Wednesday and hang out with us, but he's going. No, I have work all day, so we're going after I get off work. Oh, uh, gotcha. So, but we're going to like the like I get off Early work at like three thirty ish. Yeah, we're going to like four thirty showing. Um, so I'll get off work, go scoop him up, and then we'll head straight to the theater. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, Good, nice. Yeah, yeah, have fun. I'm looking forward Let to us it. Know. Oh, for sure, I will. Yeah. Um, well, hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another uh, fun-filled episode of the Southern Fried Geary Podcast. Uh, as per usual, I am Caleb Alexander McKenzie, Matt Trogdon, and I'm Craig Lance. And uh, it has been a long week, Craig. You weren't with us last week, and it made us all sad. It, it did. Matt um, and I actually spent like an hour I and a half. Matt had a party. No, we, we, Matt was pretty excited. It was just the two of you. It's hard Matt, to keep track of all my parties. You you say that, but he had like the puppy dog looks the whole time. It was yeah. it was very impactful on my boy. I, he he shared it the the on his Instagrams and social medias and stuff, <laughs> and he put hashtag two man podcast. Just didn't have that. the energy for another duck face picture that day. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's what. Yes, yeah. just, just stole it right out of me. Um, but on we the are social medias. He's not on. Yeah. Well, no, he is on them. He just has burner accounts. Like I'm yeah. convinced. Like I see, a, I see he has a name. Troll accounts. I see a name pop up every once in a while, and I know it's Matt, and it's, there's like no picture on it. But I'm just like, he's watching all of us. Like this is, he's just staying very quiet. He's like a spy. 
Um, but um, so you're back. How you feeling, buddy? Oh, I feel much better. Awesome. Uh, I think it was food poisoning last week or a mild, mild case of it. Um, either way, I had something. I had eaten something the day before that just didn't agree with me. Well, we so, are yeah. we are glad to have you back and healthy. Yeah. Um, for this, uh, the 193rd Holy episode. Holy crap, uh-huh. we're coming up on 200. What yes, are we going to do for our 200th episode? I don't know. We need to plan something. Yeah, we do. Um, I also don't have the energy to plan things. No, I was about to say, plan? Oh, no. <laughs> so that I'm would gonna, be different for this podcast. If gonna, we actually I'm going to plan, plan on being here. Um, that, that's the plan. No, we, we'll do something. I'm sure we'll, we'll get somebody on or we'll just have a, a, a fun time. Um, yeah, it's been crazy. 193 uh, episodes, issues, episodes, whatever you want and to call And we haven't it. killed each other yet. No. I mean. Well, I mean. You know. We're not done with this one. <laughs> so. We are headed down a path. It's, <laughs> um, it's It's been a fun ride, though. I'm glad we've gotten to do this. It's uh, it's definitely one of the highlights of my week, um, which was a long week, very stressful week. And I am, I'm glad to, to not be doing school stuff or work stuff and hanging out with you guys. Um, what about. Back to school for you this week, wasn't it? Uh, last was it week. week so, before? yeah, yeah. Two, two full weeks of the hell that is law school mixed with work mixed with an externship and last year just keep, I, just hold on brother i know you're I'm, almost I'm there pushing through um so but uh, i mean you know i can't complain though it's something i asked for and it's all part of the experience <laughs> i so. asked for this yeah. abuse <laughs> not, not only am i did i ask for it i'm paying for you, it and did, going into debt did you like apply for a safe word when you applied <laughs> for dude I, if, if i had applied <laughs> like law for a school safe should word, come with a safe word i would have been screaming that bitch the second week of the first <laughs> semester um but no, it's it's all good though. It's it's just tiring. So, but how, how about y'all? How was your collective weeks? Start with you, Greg, since you haven't. Yeah, been around it, it's a while. been good. It was busy, but it's been good. Um, you know, it's it, being when you work for yourself, being busy is a two hand two edged sword, right? Because the stress comes with it. But if you're not busy, there's no money. So it's like, you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah, it's just, you have to deal with it. Now, how about you, Matt? How? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, no, I have no right to complain. Good deal. Look at you. Makes me happy. Being all happy and everything. Yeah. I mean, he's glowing today, isn't he? He's kind of yeah. got a sheen to him. It's true. His forehead's all shiny. Uh, so, you know. So, one of my other hobbies is collecting baseball cards. Uh-huh. And the software that I use is by Beckett. Okay. Um, which is well known for their price guides and stuff for cards. Well, their software literally sucks but it's the best that's out there for tracking literally sucks oh it's horrible yeah it <laughs> literally comes through the computer and sucks huh. um no it's the best that's out there it seems but... like there's some other applications <laughs> right. for that technology yeah maybe it figuratively sucks <laughs> um just to be correct but um yeah so i started over with my collection which was a big mistake like recataloging it yeah yeah oh. that was yeah it was a bad mistake does does clz not have a card app they might, but I need the one that does the pricing. On okay, gotcha. That as well. Yeah. So that the problem is, is that you either get this or you get the, to get all of the things you need. Yeah. It usually limits the. It's same with comic books. It limits the apps you can sure use. Yeah. Um, and some of them are just better than others. You oh, know? for sure. And there, I won't say there sucks because most of the time it works fine. But when it glitches, yeah. it just kind of fucks you pretty bad. So that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's part of it. Technology. Yeah. It, it did some weird thing where I couldn't change the quantity of my cards, hmm. um, which is a problem when you're cataloging. Right. I would imagine. You know? Yeah. So I think I, this falls in the first world problem bucket. Oh, this is definitely a first world problem. <laughs> before, this is, before everybody starts dabbing the tears. Yeah. It's, uh, put this I'm, in perspective. I'm not crying. I'm just saying it just was a uh, mistake to start over. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I might be bitching, but I'm not. Yeah. It's got to be. Well, I mean. <laughs> Like it's you think about this stuff when we go back to like the early days of our collecting and stuff. I mean, I, I know I don't know about you guys, but like once upon a time there was a spiral notebook yeah. with like things written down. And then no, there wasn't to, for you. It was a spreadsheet. No, don't no, lie. No, it started off as a spiral notebook because okay. I didn't like we didn't have internet and computers when I was a kid. Uh, the world <laughs> did, but I lived out in rural Arkansas where that st- shit was just not available. Gotcha. Um, and so, but then it did go to spreadsheets, and then now, like I said, I use the CLZ app for my. Um, I use it both for comics and for videos, like DVDs and stuff, because they have an app that lets you track your movies and everything. This is how old I am. I went to college, and I learned how to do spreadsheets in college. Yeah. And the only thing I used that for for, like, the first 10 years out of school was to run a 
uh, fantasy baseball team. <laughs> I mean, a fantasy baseball league. Right. Because back then you didn't have it online. No. There was no one. Um, um, that's also how, you know. You I had mean, to put it in Gives work. you a good indication to how old I am that you couldn't track your fantasy teams online. See, I thought he was going to say back in his day when he first learned to do it, it was a hammer and chisel. That's where I thought he was going with no. it. But the, the spreadsheet made me think of that. Yes. Yeah. Well, enough about spreadsheets. We're, this is not the spreadsheet podcast. Thank although you. it might be. That's a good idea. Me and me and Jason Wood. <laughs> you and Jason start Wood a, have a we good should time. start a spreadsheet <laughs> podcast. Um, this is a comics podcast. And Craig, you were saying earlier uh, before the show that you had actually gotten caught up on a lot of your reading. Uh, I actually did. Yeah, yeah. So tell us some stuff that you read. Drop a short stack on us, brother. Yeah. So I read uh, Moon Knight number two, Marvel Comics by mm-hmm. Jed McKay, Alessandra Cappuccino. Or Cappuccio, not probably not Cappuccino. Cappuccio. There's no <laughs> in <end> there. <laughs> Cappuccio. <laughs> uh, I'm tired. This may be a long show. No, now I just want a Cappuccino. Rochelle Rosenberg and Corey Pettit. Uh, are you either of you guys reading this? I Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's really freaking good. Mm-hmm. It's it's violent. It's um, he's basically decided to take over a part of New York and protect it, uh, much like Daredevil mm-hmm. and Spider Man have their neighborhoods. Except it's being protected by a crazy man that, you know, no longer believes in the God that he is. Yeah. Powered by, I guess. So. The the religious a- applications that he's playing with in there, as far as like a split, a quote unquote split church and the yeah. uh, the, the wrong side of the religion stuff, that's interesting. Well, the, I mean, the, mo- the bad guy in there that's just been barely introduced <laughs> is Matt's laughing at something. Still I don't laughing know. at Cappuccino. <laughs> um, <laughs> is... Uh, you know he's the the representative of the church now, yeah. or as Moon Knight is it. Uh, then I got two by Tom Taylor. Um, first one is Dark Ages number one. It's uh, Tom Taylor, Ivan Coella, Brian Reber, and Joe Sabino. Mm-hmm. And listen, VC, whoever you are, I never say your name anymore, or never give your credits anymore. I just give the person that did its yeah. credits. Um, this is not the type of book that usually. Um, draws me in but I picked it up and read it uh, for you know just a it looked interesting and it was nope. it's uh, a what if story mm-hmm. out of continuity but it kind of starts from current continuity and apparently there's been some sort of metal entity that's been buried at the center of the earth for all time and is it uh, like an nth metal thing it's a no it's a being like a giant robot looking thing and it's trying to bust out of earth and causing earthquakes and so forth and uh the only way they can beat it is doctor strange well their group of them go to the earth oh this is this is marvel i'm sorry yeah i I was saying this was dc no they this is uh they go to the uh earth's core and everybody gets beat but sue and doctor strange are the only two left and Doctor Strange basically sets it up an EMP that kills the metal robot thing that's destroying Earth. Right. But he dies before he can turn off the spell. And so nothing on Earth that's electronic works. Nothing mechanical or electronic works on Earth anymore. So it basically sends Earth back into the Dark Ages. I know what book you're talking about now. I'd seen this uh, promo. It's kind of Tom Taylor's return to Marvel since Wolverine. I, I so I, I so associate Tom Taylor with with DC now. Uh, well, that funny I just, you say that because my next book is a Tom Taylor DC book, <laughs> Nightwing eighty three. Um, and unfortunately, I just closed the credit <laughs> credit pages, so I'll get back to it. Um, since he's taken over Nightwing. It's been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Again, if you haven't been reading uh, Nightwing, now's the time to jump on. Uh, we find out that uh, in the last couple of issues that uh, Dick actually has an older sister. Um, and she is working for the bad guys. But is she? She might be working right. for the FBI. She might be. So it's uh, kind of an interesting uh, story that's going on and he comes out he inherited when alfred died alfred left him all of his money mm-hmm. and alfred was a billionaire himself and uh dick grayson uh, sets up a fund to house the homeless and um, kind of start rebuilding bloodhaven using his money for for good mm-hmm. he thought that batman would try and talk him out of it so he went to superman for advice superman said well just just tell bruce he might you know 
surprise he you. might he might surprise you and dick goes maybe i'll just text him he doesn't really like conversations <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that's it, good yeah it was a pretty good uh exchange and so then batman calls him and just says i want you to know that alfred would be proud of you which was kind of cool so i was gonna say like number number one i adore these covers just because they're so kinetic like yeah. the, the way that they show the nightwing moving and there's been like the last couple of them which i'm not reading the series but the last couple of covers have caught my eye um but i, I don't know why he would think that batman would have a problem with it like batman's always funded uh orphanages and, and that well I mean, he said that, that he thought batman not so much that he would have a problem with it but he might try to redirect him gotcha, gotcha in a gotcha. different route no, I can see um, him doing that, yeah. So it's Tom Taylor, Bruno Redondo, Adriana Lucas, uh, Wes Abbott. and You know, um, everything Adriana Lucas co- colors, mm-hmm. I absolutely, absolutely uh, adore. Yeah. He's one of those uh, people that I don't necessarily look for their books, mm-hmm. but when I'm on a book that they color, you can always tell that it's them. Nice. Yeah. So. What about you, Matt? What you, what you been reading, brother? So my short stack, uh, starting with DC, Batman Fear State Alpha. A creative team on this one is James Tiny in the fourth. Ricardo Federici is artist. Chris Sotomayor is the color. And then Clayton Cows is letter. This no is, cappuccinos. No, yeah, there's no cappuccinos <laughs> in, in this one. Um This uh, feels very much like, okay, time to wrap up this storyline because... Mr. Uh, Tinyan yeah. is moving on. Yeah. yeah. So if you're, that was the feeling I got from it. Too. Yeah. Oh man, it just uh, let's let's cram the rest of the story into one book so I can do my last start. Yeah. They're just like summarizing everything on the yeah. first few pages and let's wrap this baby up is the way it feels. It but was it's, drawn it's very well. Yeah. Though. It, yeah. I mean, it's 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 good. Pretty wordy since they're you know cramming a lot. In, yeah. You know, yeah. summarizing everything, yeah. but. You know, that's not a knock. It's just... Uh, well, it kind of shows you the background on how Scarecrow did what he did. Or yeah. why he did what he did, if you're reading that. What do y'all think about this new design for Scarecrow that they've been showing? I kind of like it. Oh, I think it's, it's, it's yeah. an interesting. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting look to it. Yeah, it, I think yeah, it's really cool. Did you read the, that issue? The fear, no, I haven't yet. No, it's, it's yeah, there, coming Yeah, he up. tells the guy I'm going to need a whole bunch of burlap and some rope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> that's one of his requirements for doing this. Yeah, yeah it, almost, it almost him. looks like a, like a Mortal Kombat-esque thing that you'd expect to pop out of there like mm. with the way this his hat is just oversized i don't know i think it's it a kind really of looks like an old design. plague doctor yeah to me yeah but. also on my short stack from boom studios uh we only find them when they're dead number eight from al ewing and simone de mayo this is a very unique story mm-hmm. this is interesting is anybody else reading this I am. yeah I fell off of it yeah i mean it's it is uh <laughs> imaginative oh, i will yeah. say yeah it's quite if you're looking for something different um, are they still cutting chunks of meat out of dead gods uh no oh no okay. they are not <laughs> uh they've moved past that also on my short stack number three on the short stack is number four from marvel non-stop spider-man from joe kelly chris bocciolo tim townsend and marcio menez this is a lot of fun, man. Yeah. I really dig this. Um, oh, uh, our boy here, the villain in this story, this guy, I just blanked on his name. <laughs> Kang? No. Jesus Christ. I'm not sure. Baron Zemo. Oh, okay. Baron Zemo. God. Sorry. Man. It was hard to tell from that art. Yeah. So Baron Zemo has a, quite the villainous dialogue in this book, and there's one line in this book that is super... Zemo just cuts it right to the core on how he feels about things. Yeah. Uh, a Doesn't great dance. villain movie, a villain moment Yeah, uh, that pulls no punches with nice. Zemo. But yeah, I really dig Chris Bocciolo's art. I always have. Yeah. And he his style fits a Spider-Man story extremely well. I was kind of hoping after I read the first couple of issues in Nonstop Spider-Man that Joe Kelly would get the next amazing Spider-Man run. But yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's been really good. He seems like he'd be a good fit for it. Um, so I need to I need to check this out. I haven't read much of it. I never associate like start off. I'm not the Spider Guy like of the group, and I have there, there's a the majority of Spider Man I have not read, but I've never really associated Zemo with Spider Man. So it's interesting that that's the villain because I always think of Zemo. I think of Captain America or the Avengers. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So it's interesting seeing seeing Spider Man go up against him. Hey, mm-hmm. You show up in Queens, oh, you yeah, get yeah. the spider for sure. I, I mean. 
It makes sense. I just it's you like show up in Hell's Kitchen, you that, get Red Batman. That's part of why I couldn't couldn't figure out who that was just off of the the cover too, because I don't. It was associate the shading on yeah, his face. I didn't recognize him. the mask at first. Well, I'm going to stick with the House of Ideas since that's where we're kind of at with my short stack. So starting with number three of the 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 Scamma Flight series, are y'all? I mean, I'm, I know Matt's reading this. Craig, mm-hmm. are you you yeah. reading this? Yeah, just. It's a spinoff from the Immortal Hulk uh, thing, and it's awesome. It's Al Ewing, Crystal Frazier, Lam Medina, and Antonio Fabella um, doing it. And it really centers around this little cast of characters that are, you know, they kind of Alpha Flight, kind of not Alpha Flight. All of them have been imbued with some type of gamma um, or poisoning or powers or, or <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, and they're, they're on this quest to... There, there was this, uh, I guess, clandestine organization uh, from Immortal Hulk that was like doing gamma testing on people against their will, and so now Gamma Flight, this team has formed up, and they're going to like rescue all those folks, or they're trying to shut them down. And they've got this new character who's a young, uh, young African American woman, who you know she hulks out and does all kind of weird stuff, but. Um, they're trying to assist her and just really she just to out and does weird stuff. Um, well, I mean, like she she I'm doesn't hulk out like yeah. turn green, but she's like this weird Cronenbergian body yeah. morph thing. Um, but like they're they're trying to get her back to where she needs to be, and I'm being vague about it because it's you know short stack. But um, they they come on this town in the third issue, and there's all these like irradiated kind of zombie people, and they have to have. Uh, a really, really cool knockdown drag out fight, but it doesn't end the way you would think it would end. I, I really enjoyed this this whole whole thing. Um, then, not a Marvel book. Uh, this actually comes from our friends over at Image Comics. Um, it's a book called Old Head by the creative team uh, that we all really, really enjoy from other from everything they do together. But it's Kyle Starks and Chris Schweitzer. Um, this is a kind of mini graphic novella that they, they do together. Rock. Mountain, candy. yeah, they did Rock, rock Candy Mountain. Rock candy. Uh, then they, I knew they, it was Rock man, Mountain and Candy, but I didn't know the order. Of <laughs> Cappuccino. Women. They're they're yeah, also Cappuccino. the team doing the <laughs> six side kicks of Trick or Keaton right now too. So they've got like they're they just do really great work. Yeah, mm-hmm. sounds, sounds like a great sequel, by the way. Right. <laughs> um, but no, so in this one, it's a mix. I'll just read you the the back of it. This is a madcap action horror story of the world's toughest former pro basketball player, and he goes home with his kid. Um, kind of learn about his you know his destiny and his you know where he came from, his mom, his ancestry, and everything. Um, and then right next door, Dracula and all of these old like m- old movie monster goons are all just sitting up getting ready for Halloween. Um, it's it's exactly what you expect from from Kyle Starts and Chris Schweitzer. Over the top, the cartoonies, cartoons hilarious. Everything is exaggerated. It, it is ridiculous in the best kind of way, um, and it celebrates kind of Halloween and these monster movie things. So if you haven't gotten that, I highly recommend it. Um, and then last but certainly not least, bouncing over to DC, um, I've never been a huge Supergirl fan. Um, I actually started watching uh, the WB show um, about a year and a half ago, kind of get caught up on it, and it made me enjoy the character. Um, since then I've gone back and thanks to some friends, I've been able to have collect like the whole Supergirl. Um, I think it was Peter David I run. Lo- I loved the Supergirl run pre new 52. Yeah. I, I want to say that was the Peter David run. I think I that's think the one so, I have, but I couldn't tell you who was on, but I know I loved that. Run, I, it's, so. it's incredible. I've yeah. been able to read through most of it, but right now over at DC currently there is a new Supergirl book called Supergirl woman of tomorrow. And this is being written by Tom King, uh, drawn by Bilquis Everly. Um, Mathis Lopez is doing the colors and Clayton Cowles is doing the letters. So kind of the 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 thing behind this book is Supergirl wanted to take a vacation. Um, she needed to get away from Earth and all of her like things that's happening here. So she bounces off into space and just lands on random planet. Well, obviously, and of course, random planet is going through some things. Um, and so she actually takes this uh, small girl, this child um, whose family has been killed, and she's helping the girl track down the murderer. And as they do that, they're kind of bouncing through the galaxy. Well, they get to this planet in the third one where there's been uh, just just a smidgen of genocide take place. A um, of and genocide. so they have to <laughs> they have to uh, figure out what happened. They kind of go on this detective mystery when nobody will cooperate with them, um, and then they figure out what how um, the the a significant portion of the population came no longer to be, and how it ties in with the man that they're tracking down this this murderer. Um, that killed this girl's family. So um, if you're not reading this, it's tons of fun. Bilquis Everly's art on this is is beautiful. Um, I could just look at these pages all day. There's something incredibly um, just enticing about the way that she draws 
um, Supergirl and just this world around them. So that's that's on the end of my short stack. So if, um, good books all around. I want to add something to this old okay. head book. Did you look at the categorization on the back? You know how they, you know, the, the barcodes, they always have categorization. Yeah. Did you read it? No, I, I didn't. Horror sports humor. <laughs> Horror sports humor. <laughs> There's like three books in that niche. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Horror, <laughs> sports, humor, <laughs> drama. Uh, that's, that's a crossroads you don't see every day. Yeah, no, I didn't notice right. that. Yeah. Um, did you Did you know this was coming out? Did you see this? I've been seeing him uh, promoted on Twitter, yeah. Nice. Um, so did it just come out as an OGN or was it Yeah. A, okay. No, it did just came out. I, I love that the main character or one of the main characters. Uh, yes. He's got slam dunk <laughs> on, on his knuckles tattooed. Tattooed on his knuckles, yeah. <laughs> nice. I may um, have to pick that one up. It's it's really yeah no. I mean I, everything that they do is good. So it will probably um it will probably be on my book of the week on a week that we do book of the weeks at some point um because it's just that much fun. Um, but this is not one of those weeks. We're not doing books of the week this week. Bum bum bum. We're doing a roundtable, but we're not doing where we pick our own. We're bringing book. chaos and we're making yeah. it chaotic. We because we, we're doing it out of order. We Try had and- planned something <laughs> special for last week, but we postponed it. Um, cause we can't really talk about the subject matter without Craig here. That just wouldn't be right. Wouldn't be fair. We all would feel bad about it, but we'll get to that later. Um, this week, as usual, we got together and we decided to all, um, pretty close to simultaneously read the same comic. It's a new book that came out. Um, and it was one that I, I you know, we were all pretty excited about. Um, but we like to throw it on the round table just so that we can get a feel for what each other thought about it. We can give some different perspectives to it, bounce off one another. Um, and in order to do that, there's there's going to be spoilers, right? So um, if you haven't read uh, Red Sonia number one, you should go do that. You should do that as soon as possible. You should pull up Comicsology, or you should head out to your local comic shop. You should do whatever you need to do. Um, but but we don't want to spoil it from for you um, if you haven't enjoyed it yet. That that would that would dampen our spirits and yours. So go check that out. But um, yeah, it as, dampen mine because we gave them a warning. Well, Craig just doesn't give a shit. Yeah, mm. Craig's just like, nope, cry. <laughs> just mm. Don't cry on the books though. <laughs> That's why we have sleeves. Um, no, so uh, <laughs> as alluded to, we all got together and we read Red Sonia number one. Now this was uh, this was written by um, somebody I know. Craig is a really big fan of Mirka Andolfo, um, with some some co writing um, by uh, by Giuseppe Cafaro. I think Giuseppe did some of the art on the book as well. Um, the the way it's laid out on my thing is weird. I just noticed that. Uh, so yeah, uh, Merck Andolfo, uh, something, something cappuccino. Giuseppe, <laughs> Giuseppe Cafaro, uh, does the art on it. Um, it's, so just what, what did you guys think? Give me the, the 30,000 foot well, view he from finishes it. digging up the credits. Well, I have the credits pulled up, but the credits on comicsology are stupid. Stupid. stupid and they don't credits. make any sense. Matt, go ahead. You're the oh, really, Sonya fans. Yeah. I really liked the book. I really did. thought it was very well done. Yeah, I enjoyed the crap out of this book. I, and I'm not the mark for Red Sonia. Sonia. Is it Sonia? Sonia, yeah. Yeah, that Matt is, but um, I really enjoyed this book. Uh, I th- When I first flipped through it at the store, I was like, eh, the art's not grabbing me. But when I read it, I liked the art a whole lot better. Oh, yeah, I love the yeah. art in it. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really... It, like I said, I, I don't know if I just caught a panel I didn't like or whatever, but I really enjoyed the art. I enjoyed the story. Um Felt it was uh, done really well. Matt, you've got the physical copy in front of you. Why don't you read off the because because I used I, I got mine digitally and so it I know that there's a co-writing qu- credit, but where we're sitting at right now, I don't. Yes, have I will back access. clean up for you. Yes, thank you. Pretty. So pretty the good. writers on this are Mir- Mirka Andolfo and Luca Bellangrino. That's the name. Illustrator yeah. is Giuseppe Cafaro. Colorist is Chiara De Franchi. De Franchia. Close enough. Yep. No, it works. Um, I, I thought the book was fun. Um, I thought it was a fantastic kind of first issue. Uh, it's it, look. Uh, I'm on the record. There have been some some of Merck Andolfo's solo books. I think her art is gorgeous, but there's been some of her solo I, writing that I'm the same. has been you know yeah. kind of like driving across a gravel road a little bit. It's a little rocky. Uh, but <laughs> I wouldn't go that. Hmm. No, I, it's it's not. Damn. It's not bad. Uh, it, but it's not great. It's. <laughs> It, yeah. some, some, hey, look, I grew up in the country. Sometimes the gravel roads are smoother than the paved roads. But it is. It's kind of it's kind of rocky uh, in the way. But this was not. This was this was smooth. The whole thing yeah. was really, really well done. Um, and I think part of that, it was interesting to see, and I haven't read her last book, but I think having a co-writer on this 
um, played into some of that too. Um, and maybe it was so. Most of her books are were published in Italy and yeah. are being translated over here. And I think some of it's getting lost in the translation. That, that could very well be the case, which is maybe why they've got a co-writer on this, right? So. Uh, yeah, and so yeah, no, I thought it was fun. Um, from a, I, I I'm a Red Sonia Mark in the sense of I like to read most things that de, you know derive from Conan that that's been out of that the Conan world. I, you know, sword and sorcery is is pretty high on my list of things that I enjoy. So I thought this was great, and it's it's got the you know it's got all the hallmarks of the of the Red Sonia books that what we've all loved in the past. You know, there's a you know hero kind of doing good you know you can sense a a turn coming um as far as some of the characters and the aspect but she's she's fighting for the underdog and some of the some of the best red sonia stories are, are where she's you know she gets into shenanigans trying to fight for the underdogs so so what happened in this story um well red sonia is doing you know what red sonia does best she's trying to make a living while selling her swords and going on adventures um and Long story short, she essentially gets hired to go on a, a mission that whether you know it depends on what the, what your perspective is, and it depends on who actually is the good guy is is either a rescue mission or a kidnapping mission. <laughs> We're not completely sure which one, but um, years and years ago, there was this young girl uh, who was born in in the the southeastern portion of of this land, you know, in in the Hyborian age, and she was born to to. Her, her parents were mystics or she was born into this culture that recognized magic and kind of were setting her up to be uh, a spiritual leader of sorts is the, the gist I got out of it. And she's got all these markings down her arms, all these tattoos and stuff. She kind of glows and she's silver haired. She stands out in the crowds, what I'm trying to say. Uh, and, but, but something happened and they were raided and this kid was kidnapped and this kid was taken to this, this village to be raised to, um, away from away from everything she knew uh, and and how she got there were not 1000 percent clear on if it was a um, you know if it was a mission to smuggle her out or a rescue mission or if it, she was just sold through the markets the way a lot of things happened uh, in in this world uh, we're not 1000 percent sure but um, she has been in this village for a long time and red Sonia has been tasked with going and bringing her home uh, but when red Sonia gets to the village, it's been ransacked. It's it's gone. Like it, you know, the, everything has been burnt down. There are bodies uh, just strewn out everywhere, and it looks like there were no survivors. And these these kind of uh, you know ne'er do well looking guys are pillaging, <laughs> um, and they're a little they're a little upset because they're the they're well, basically they're wearing the, leather because <laughs> usually that's how you tell when they're. I meant think to they be did. They but it, but also it's cold too. So, yeah. um, but. They they're kind of just pillaging the village there, and they're complaining because essentially they're the cleanup crew. Like all the 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 guys, you know, who are really important to this little army that they're with have have already been here. They've taken everything worth taking. Um, they've done all the the murder that they wanted to do, and there's just nothing left for these guys. And so they feel kind of they feel kind of some kind of way about it. <laughs> they're they're not happy. Um, and so as they're sitting there just grumbling and complaining, Red Sonia shows up looking awesome and red haired and on her little horse. Um, just being a badass, and she proceeds to just do what she does best, to, to lay waste um, and take these guys uh, and, and, you know, unhand them, <laughs> literally. Uh, you know, so that's, it, it was fun. The action sequence was great. Um, by the end of this, uh, she actually finds this young girl. She's not dead. It's not all lost, and she realizes who she is, and she has, has got her, and they, they are starting their adventure back to um, return this girl um through one way or another back to the land that she came from because her parents are apparently looking for her. Um, I, I had a lot of fun with this. I think it's got, you know, I, I think it's got all the, like I said, all the hallmarks of a really, really enticing, really fun um, Red Sonia story. Um, it's violent in the best kind of ways. It's sensual in the best kind of ways. It's got heart to it. It's, it's inevitably, there's going to be a hard choice that she has to make. There's a, a moral twist um, that's going to happen. The, the way this is laid out, I I have no complaints with the the art whatsoever. I'm, it's it's beautiful. Uh, it's very kinetic. The the colors that they threw in there. Most of the book is done in reds and oranges because fire plays a huge part into this book. Um, and, and and you'll have to read that to find out why. Uh, but the 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 hues that they use in this really just grabbed me. Um, and I just had I had so much fun reading this. But the, I want to hear from you guys. What did you guys think? I love that the little girl keeps calling her mom. Yeah. 
and she's like, I'm not your mom. And so she's taken to nicknaming her Brat and just <laughs> yeah. calls her Brat through the whole thing. How, how many times do I have to tell you I'm not your mom, Brat? Um, but of course, you know, because Red Sonia is the mercenary barbarian mm-hmm. with the soul and a heart, she obviously is, you know, having some feelings uh, about yeah. protecting this child beyond just her mercenary role in it. Well, it's it's a character trope, right? It's kind of like when Wolverine um, connects with the kids that Wolverine takes care of. Like, you know, on paper, or when you see Wolverine in action, you're like, this person should never never watch children. This is not the person <laughs> you want to be a teacher or the babysitter. But some of Wolverine's best relationships have been with, you know, people like Jubilee, or people like Quentin Quire, or um, even iBoy, these, these younger generation of kids that, that he, he would die for. And that he would do anything in his power to make sure that they're safe and, and grow up, uh, you know, to be the same type of um, killer that he is. Uh, he's really just investing in the future is, is what's, what's happening. Um, and, and the, well, when the I think they, of Red Sonia, I don't really think of maternal instincts too much. Yeah. In fact, I quite think no, the it's opposite, the opposite of yeah. that. But, um, yeah, it, it's an interesting... Uh, uh, dichotomy here that's going on so yeah i really liked the violence in the story it's nice to see <laughs> red sonia doing her thing of with course. her sword yeah. and so the violence i really appreciated a lot uh the dialogue <laughs> i thought was great it was easy to read yeah wasn't very t- wasn't you know um what i would call text heavy so it was just it was just a fun easy to read story uh, that fit, yeah. it seemed to fit the character very, very well. Yeah, the art carries the story when it has to, and the dialogue carries yeah. it when yeah. it needs to. And um, speaking of violence, that the fight scene when they're kind of entrapped in that mm-hmm. valley yeah. towards the end of the book is pretty freaking amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, just I, Red Sonia being Red Sonia. Yep. And just well, when again, I think you put it great. Like she's the mercenary with the heart. Like so, they're they're walking through and they're having this moment, and then she tells the kid to stop. She she's she's kind of accepted the fact. Oh, I'm going to train this. This kid's going to learn something from me. Uh, and she tells the kid, "Stop. Okay, you're the perfect distance away from me. Now just watch this and watch what happens." Um, it, it she's almost there's almost like a tutelage thing happening here. Um, that I'm I'm curious to see where yeah, she it goes. Says, tells her schools in session. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's it, it's got all of the the things that a first issue needs to mm-hmm. draw you in. You already know who the character is, so you don't need a reintroduction of yeah. Red Sonja, but um, you get the basis of the story. You kind of get a sense of where it's going and what it's doing, and uh, yeah, I'm here for it. Kids are kind of hard to write, especially for adult readers, because we all think of kids as you know, kind of one-dimensional sometimes. I thought they did a really good job fleshing out this, uh, <laughs> fleshing out the kid. You know, you see this this... This young girl who, you know, she's she's kind of mesmerized by Red Sonja. Number one, she just saw Red Sonja kick ass and, and you know, cut the, literally cut the hands off of a dude um, and carterize them and send him back off to uh, his boss to tell him what happened. Um, but she, she's decided she wants to be like Sonja. And, you know, and she's having this moment where she's just loud and she finds a stick. And, you know, you know it, like all kids, you know, a good stick is a good sword. Uh, you know, and she's out playing with it. She's talking about everything she's going to do. And, you know, just, just this brash and... You know, mixture of innocence uh, that that you get roped into this kid, while she's talking about murder. But it's it's you know it's it's this borderline cute and kind of inspiring thing. I love the juxtaposition though with Sonya how how she does treat the kid with, for lack of a better word, like kid gloves. You know, she she doesn't just like you know tell her to shut the fuck up or and you know pipe down. She no, but, but she jokes her advice with her a to her bit. is yeah. the first thing I would tell you is to be less yeah, loud if to, you want to, to quiet eat. down. <laughs> um, and then she, you know, Sonia just to, you know show how how awesome you know and and how talented and skilled she is and how really dangerous she is. She takes the same stick the kid has. She just like launches it into the woods and nails a squirrel. <laughs> so, but but that's what I, you know. If if Conan had been in that position, you know, Conan would have been like you know just be quiet. Like they, like Conan would have gagged the kid. Hey, no, <laughs> he would not have gagged the child. <laughs> he would have put it. He put it stuffed. Tied Absolutely in, not. Stuffed no, in yeah. horse this bag. man doesn't know Conan. Obviously, oh, shit. give him a pass. No, Conan would. Conan would have told this kid to hush and would have just sat there brooding and would not have had anything to do with the kid whatsoever. Would have taken the kid, going to the same place, but would not have had nearly as much patience. Conan would have slept at night. <laughs> like I said, there would have been a gag involved. They just shut up. No, um, but but. Which so, is one Sonya of the other this, great lines in the book. Is yeah. You don't sleep or you don't eat. And Sonya says, I prefer being awake and to sleep, and I prefer 
hunger to satiation. Yeah. It was, yeah. Keeps you on your toes. So I metal. had a, yeah, right. It is pretty say, metal. Say it louder for the kids in the back. It's metal. Yeah, thank you. Um, she waits till right before she's going to pass out and she eats a cube of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> what movie is that from? Uh, I don't want to say it because Matt will make fun of me. Oh, forever. I remember that movie. I just can't remember what it's from. Save uh, the Last Dance, probably. No, it's not. It's from uh, Devil Wears Prada. That's what it is. Hey, I love that movie. I adore that movie. Um, but no, so it's one of I, it's one of the few, twitching. It's one of the few movies I've gone and seen in theaters uh, multiple times. Did um, you really enjoyed it? Don't care what you say. I haven't gonna, said a word. <laughs> uh, the, but the no, twitching so, eyebrow says it all, Matt. <laughs> are you are you guys planning on staying on this book? Uh, Absolutely. The, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out and see where it goes. So a lot of times I end up collecting Red Sonya yeah. more than reading it. So I, I always get the first you like i'll sign up for every run that comes out mm-hmm. and i end up oh ah, well, it's only going to be six issues anyways or 10 issues and i get three issues in and i just kind of get bored with it uh, this one to me has a compelling story that seems like i'll be hooked to the end yeah well i can't help but to juxtapose it with the last red sonya um that, that i read i know that they've been some Is other the mark uh, russell yeah the mark russell red sonya mm-hmm. and it's, it's just such a totally different kind of story uh, both of them were, were were a lot of fun but you know, Mark Russell's book was more about military strategy and this this view of the Hyborian age, um, as, as far as like a Game of Thrones kind of thing. This this emperors and and well, the armies. one thing that both the books do, do is put her in a position she doesn't want to be in. Right. She doesn't want to be the the queen of Hyboria that's leading the military. That's right. not her thing. And then in this one, she she doesn't want to be a mom that's babysitting this kid yeah. for you know, three weeks across the country, you know, or however long it's going to be. For sure. Seven and, issues or whatever. <laughs> and this kind of takes a zoomed in look on just her, like, like more so at, with nobody having her back. And, you know, some like you go back to the old Roy, Roy Thomas stories, most of the time it's just her. And so I thought that was different. And I, I appreciated Mark Russell taking that take on it where he, he shows, okay, this is, this is her as a general. This is not just her being awesome at hand-to-hand combat. She knows combat through and through, and can can lead armies. Um, and and like Craig said, she can do it begrudgingly because she, she knows lives are at stake. Um, where this one kind of zooms in, and it's just it, like she's she's solely dependent on her um, and her her abilities. I, I thought that was really it's really neat to see these, you know, just in the matter of a year to see this the fleshed out position of yeah this this kind of broad swath of who she is. Well, the th- over uh, overriding theme with uh, I think the best Red Sonja stories, including the Mark Russell one, was that she's always underestimated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And usually she's physically underestimated. Mm-hmm. That's always, you know, like in this story, that's obviously prevalent. And in the I think in the best stories she is. That's one of the more compelling things about the character. But in Mark Russell's run, that was all about her being, um, you know, uh, mentally underestimated. Right. And her making these, applying military strategy not only to battle but to um, political maneuvers as well. I was going to say the second half of that series was the political manipulation, right? Was more political. Well, it was pretty much, I mean, it was laced 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 throughout, yeah. Yeah, That's true. The the spinoff of that book was really fun, too, where they focus Mm -hmm. on the kid. Yeah. Um, that's the, the, like the Mark Russell's Red Sonja series did. It had it had more of a a Game of Thrones type feel to it, uh, where where this this has more more of an old school Conan or yeah. an old school Tarzan or old school adventurer kind of Don't feel to it. Don't you go there? <sighs> <laughs> what did you do that for, Kevin? I know he's listening. Mm. We got a guy that comes and hangs out with us at shop on Wednesdays. Oh Kevin. no, I was just saying from and like he, the pulp uh, era. He he said the other day that pretty much Tarzan and Conan were the same. Oh no, they're not at all. Like no, I wasn't saying that either. Yeah. That's but, why we both twitched when you said that. No, I was just doing that in the sense of this, you know, pulp era heroes that are born from the, you know, 18 probably 1880s to the yeah. 1940s. You had this kind of thing and you had these adventurers who go out and um, you know, use nothing more than a sword or their bare hands to, you know, and their own brawn um, and a lot of loincloths. So. Well, and there's another. Speaking of loincloths, there's another scene in here where she's. I mean, they're in the snow, yeah. And the little girl's like, "You're going to get cold," and she's like, "I prefer it this way." <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
So, I mean, it, just some great dialogue in yeah. the book. There's, um, I mean, again, Matt's more of the Red Sonja uh, mark, but it uh, seems to me that, that they captured her character very, very well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm on board. Yeah, Can't wait me too. to do with that. Uh, so, all right. So let's 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 talk about something we we alluded to last week. Um, this in this past week, uh, I should say two weeks ago, the Spider-Man No uh, No Way Home trailer came out, mm-hmm. and I think we got a feel for a lot of what this uh, movie is going to be and how it's going to kind of break the mold a little bit and do some really interesting things. Um, so I'm assuming we've all watched the trailer at mm-hmm. this point, right? Yep. Rewatched um, it this morning. Yeah. Um, so, what do you guys think about? Like, Craig, you're the Spider-Man kind of aficionado of the group. So, so start with the trailer. Tell me what you thought about the trailer. What you found like, you know, kind of interesting about it. So, yeah. First of all, I'm, I'm super excited for this movie. Um, I have a theory that's based on the titles. Mm-hmm. Um, so far, the titles have been pretty much dead on. We had Homecoming that took place around Homecoming. We had Far From Home because it took place in another. Dimension. <laughs> Dimen- no, in another uh, country. Right. And now we have No Way Home. And we have this multiverse, multiversal thing happening. I have a feeling that we're about to get a new Spider-Man in our uh, MCU. Hmm. And Peter's going to be left in the multiverse is what I think is about to happen. But that's just a theory. It's nothing... Um, I feel like their titles have been pretty exact so far, so that's what's got me thinking that. Um, I've heard that you know a lot of people talk about Doctor Strange doesn't seem like Doctor Strange, that he's a variant, or you know, of course, everything is Mephisto now. Right. Um, <laughs> I I I don't see it. I think it's Doctor Strange. Yeah, but no, that's just, I I think people want to read a lot into these trailers and what, you know, you're getting glimpses. And and you also have to remember that Marvel's really bad about, or really good at showing you misdirections in their trailers. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. um, What we see may not be what we get, but what we've seen is very compelling to me. Yep. So the the trailer kind of starts off with MJ and um, and Pete up on a rooftop and they're reading the a magazine. I don't know if it's actually the Daily Bugle or not. I couldn't see the um, thing on it, but they're they're reading this magazine, and this all kind of spills out after um, um, Far From Home. Yeah, the events uh, and, at the end of Far From yeah, Home. Yeah, so Mysterio kind of literally unmasked Pete. Like now, the world knows that Peter Parker and Spider Man are one and the same, and obviously this has caused some a lot of problems in his life, uh, both personal, professional, being able to fight crime. It's put everybody he knows in danger, um, and so th- like th- that's going to. That's, that's the push. So he goes to Doctor Strange and says, hey, like, can you just cast a spell to make everyone forget what I did? I mean, very, very much um, brand new day, or you can even go uh, through this, the... To me, it's more of the Daredevil, yeah, because the, Daredevil did that um, after he had unmasked. Mm-hmm. He went to... Um, brand new day, you know, was Mephisto, which is why everybody's trying to plug right. Doctor Strange is Mephisto in this, but... I, to me, it feels more like they're combining the story from Daredevil. It feels but, that way. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, go ahead. So they, like, he he goes to him and is just like, you know, I want to cast a spell, and you know, I guess Strange is all about it. it you know, against the the warnings of Wong, as Wong is walking out <laughs> and saying, "Hey, you probably shouldn't do this." Um, they they go ahead and and do this, and what they do is they they blow a hole in the multiverse by by everything we see from the the trailers. Uh, you know, it, it opens the door to all of these. Uh, dimensional things and it's letting in some of the villains that we've seen in other um, iterations of Spider-Man cross over. I mean, we already have seen, you know, through Loki and through WandaVision, uh, the manipulation of magic and the, what happens when, when time is meddled with. Um, and, you know, we, we saw in the, the last two Avengers, uh, you know, this big tentpole event, the, these, these multiple worlds that are created when time is splintered. Um, and so I think that's what we're getting at here. Well, and I don't think I think the last two Avengers movies. The point was you couldn't splinter time. There was one direct timeline because no matter what they did, they couldn't screw it up. Well, they couldn't. They couldn't change it. Right. Yeah. So um, now with the events of Loki, and what I'm interested in is where this takes place in relationship to the Loki mm-hmm. events, because to me, if if Strange is casting that spell about the time that Loki. And uh, Sylvie kind of destroyed the timelines. 
and you've got now you've got all these various right that would really make sense where strange could have done it but now that that happened oh no now we've got all of this multiverse that was yeah. created so well and if i'm not mistaken like I, I don't know if it's official or not but people have like pinpointed on the timeline when things supposedly happen um apparently like wandavision and uh and the loki stuff was supposed to take take place actually before the last man the last spider-man movie um, somebody is making the comment um, in the last Spider-Man movie where the the principal, you know, they're, they're seeing the big water figure that's supposed to be Hydro, but it's not really Hydro, um, smashing things. And the principal's like, you know, being a man of science, I assume this is magic. So the, supposedly because they already know about Agatha Harkness and Scarlet Witch, like the, because it happens before that. So I don't know. So I'm curious to see when it's going to, to line up and the effects, because they are, like they are playing this giant web game with the MCU uh, that that's like everything is impactful and it can be impactful retrospectively which I think is is pretty brilliant I'm hoping that at the end of this we get a Miles Morales in the yeah. MCU now it doesn't have to be Miles Morales at the expense of Peter Parker it could be both but yeah. I would love to see that happen I mean since they're kind of building we know we're getting Reary here at some point kind of building this new generation of superheroes would be kind of cool to see. Yeah, that. Young Avengers or Champions. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. So I thought it was interesting too if you when when they're up on the when they're up on the rooftop just chit-chatting, if you look at the graffiti in the background, one of the graffiti things says Ditko. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, there there's lots of little so little even though he would definitely not want it there. No. Sure. So but. here's what I don't understand about what I've seen so far in the trailer is how did they vilify Peter when he was, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're saying he killed Mysterio, but I mean, Mysterio was a villain, but they don't know that. So when Mysterio put out his last like video, um, he makes it look like Peter Parker was the one behind like sicking all these like murder robots right. on London. That's right. And also it made it look like Pete was the one who orchestrated killing Mysterio. Cause remember the the That's world, right thought Mysterio was the good guy. And you had J. Jonah Jameson doing his whole um, Infowars.net style web show um, <laughs> where he was like riling all these people up. So at large, people thought slash still think that, that Mysterio That's was right. the hero. That's right. That. I, it's been a minute since it's, I watched it. It's this whole before. fake news misdirection thing that they're laying out. So that part um, I, I think is great. Um, and wrapping that up because I was I, sitting there watching that and then when the Avengers came out, you're like, you can't just not acknowledge that didn't happen like you got to pick up that thread somewhere so it's going to be cool to see now, yeah but you also think that you know some of the avengers that are still alive might come to his defense and say no 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 yeah the, you know he helped us save the world he's a good guy you know but it's peter parker and if you don't have the struggle you don't have peter parker right. so <clears throat> well, and, you and know if you don't have jay jonah jameson trying to slam the reputation of peter of uh, spider-man you don't have spider-man yeah. so I mean, it, it makes sense. It was just like, I didn't remember that they had twisted it at the end of the last yeah. one. So. I need to go back and rewatch it because that, that was a good show, um, <laughs> the Monkey Spider. Um, so, but, but we also got our first kind of look at Alfred Molina back in action. Yeah. Um, a very de-aged Alfred Molina now that I've gone back and no, they they did they used de the same type of de-aging technology on him that they did it with Stark and everything else as far as the movie goes. He looks younger. Um, and he even talks about that in one of the interviews that he did, saying okay. they're using uh, like the anti wrinkle CG stuff on him. Because I mean, if you look at Alfred Molina now, like he's he's an elderly man, like he so he's he's definitely aged. Um, he's pretty much looked the same since I saw him in Raiders of the Lost Ark the first time. <laughs> okay, <Huh? laughs> uh, I think he's aged a little bit since then. Um, so they they they're doing that. So you're seeing you're seeing Doc Ock, the Sam Raimi Doc Ock, come out and fight. Um, you also see one of the Goblin bombs, one of the pumpkin bombs in this, and you hear you don't see but you hear a cackle, a voice that sounds a whole lot like Sam Raimi's Green Goblin. Um, and, I personally think it's going to be a quick trip through the multi. I mean, it's going to be kind of like maybe a battle against the villains, but. Yeah. Um, it also wouldn't surprise me to see Doc Ock be the version of Doc Ock that was at the end of the Dan Slott run where he's uh, Spider-Man. Okay. It, it, you know, just for them to throw a twist in there where he's got Peter's The body swap thing, yeah. Yeah. 
I could, I could see that, and that would play in with the title, the the No Way Home. Um, yeah. Something else I thought about too, if they're bringing all these people into the multiverse, and the multiverse is folding in on itself, and and you know closing, and they're they're stuck. You know, this the story could be about Parker um, trying to open up the portals and get these people back home. Um, you know, we 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 saw some of that in uh, oh the. I forget the name of it now, but Into the Spider-Verse, where, where some of these people that we would assume were, were good guys were not so good guys and bad guys, and they, like, they're going through these trials and when tribulations. you deal with a multiverse, there's no telling what yeah. they're doing because you could have everybody be a twisted version right, of Right, you might get the variant of Green Goblin that's that's a hero. <laughs> and I you know, know but I don't think you're going to get that in here. things is to uh, speculate, speculate yeah. on what's going to happen. He just rather wait and enjoy it but I, you, know, you know i think looking at it what what could be happening is that these people are stuck on our plane that they're stuck on our earth and they can't get home and so much of this is spider-man and in a way um dr strange teaming up to to send these people back home because, because you know we can't have a spider-man movie where he doesn't have a mentor or a helper right it. yeah that has been kind of a bummer yeah yeah but it's a formula and they love their formulas they do love their formulas so, but definitely i i I wish we could have, which I don't know if they're going to make another Spider-Man movie after this or not. Oh, definitely. I'm sure. You think so? Oh, absolutely. Spider-Man's never going away. So, you know, I want to see Peter Parker be Spider-Man without having to have the grown-up chaperoning him through the movies. It it drives me nuts. I think at some point, I I think that that's they're 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 tracking both what they're what they're doing with the MCU with with real life. I think at some point. I uh, forget his name. Who's the the kid who plays Spider Man? Tom Holland. Uh, Tom Holland. I think at some point Tom Holland is going to start looking his age because Tom Holland's in his mid twenties now, um, but he still looks like a teenager. Um, and so I think once that he he has this physical uh, physicalness about himself, and he may never. I mean, I'm a 33 year old dude who can't grow a beard and has baby face, so who knows? <laughs> but at some point when he starts looking like he's an adult, I think they may treat Spider Man like he's an adult I can't in grow the, a beard either. the comics. Uh, bullshit! You're over here looking like Santa with a curled mustache. Um, I think you may see more of that. But as long as long as he still looks like he's a kid and they're still dressing him up like a kid, I, I wonder when we're going to get that grown up Spider Man because that like college age Spider Man is some of my favorite Spider Man throughout the stories, throughout the books because he does have this more um, this authority about himself when he's an adult more so than he did in the teenage. So you years. go back and you read the original comics. Mm-hmm. Peter had less than any help in the original oh, yeah, it was just high school. That's, Peter yeah. had less than help. He went to the Fantastic Four for help, and they threw him out of the yeah. Baxter building. Um, he he was left on his own, and to me, that's it, it's been. I, I I know why they did it, but I really it's my least favorite part of the right. MCU Spider-Man movies. That's not to say I haven't enjoyed them, but. Let Peter struggle. That's, yeah, that's, that's part of who his character that's is. It's a major part of his character. Yeah. yeah. Major Not getting, part. you know, iron suits from Iron Man. Being and, broke. Yeah. Having to stitch his own costume yeah. together. Yeah. And, the iron spider suit stuff really bums me out. Yeah. It really bums me out. And it's not going away now that he has yeah, it. Yeah, because he's it again. They're not going to go backwards with it. But yeah. Even I'll, the web shooters, he had to make those in the garage yeah. in his yeah. in Aunt May's <clears> garage. Yeah. <throat> The These footage are, of the with the footage of the raw footage of him, you know, in his basically his pajamas and, and goggles yeah. that Tony confronts him with. Right. Man, I want to watch a whole movie of that. <laughs> I was like, you yeah. know, man. I mean, it, it's <clears throat> just yeah. It, it it is what it is. And and the movies have been good, but it it's kind of a bummer that we're not getting that struggling peter parker yes he's struggling in other ways but Mm -hmm. it's typical teenager ways it's not peter parker ways i mean you always have to take like the typical struggles of whatever age he's at and then multiply it by like 10 right i mean that and then you've got this kid juggling two lives you know being a teenager it's that's why i think sam rammy's spider-man 2 i think is the best spider-man story yet in the mcu <clears throat> I, I i you know i don't know anybody that disagrees with that frankly no, no that's that's the best one i've seen other than the into the spider verse um that's like i think that's one of my which favorite is, things yeah which is miles period. morales in a different right. story yeah. but it's um you know it it is they just the, the charm of the character has really been diminished by the new 
you know, the, the MCU run. As much as I t- love Tom Holland as Spider-Man, yeah, he's, he's great. The story that they put him in is really, you know, they the charm of him being broke, trying to do homework, trying to have a part-time Having job. Having to work for the bugle to yeah. sell pictures of Spider-Man mm-hmm. to make and, money. And a big thing is <clears throat> another cornerstone of the character is his humor and you know him using that humor to make light of these yep. very dangerous situations that he's yep. in and how dangerous spider-man himself is right you know that all of that has kind of been diminished in yeah. the mcu they don't really see you know the MC, they don't the fact that he has to hold back to keep yeah. from killing yeah. the people because he's yeah. just literally that strong yeah and and I don't think they've really touched on the genius of Peter Parker yet. No, either. very little. And that yeah. that was always my biggest problem with it is that you know, Pete is a genius in his own right. Like he yep. is a genius you know, level he's a intelligence physicist. He's an engineer. Uh, you know, and it, like his his genius has always been held back by his economic circumstances. He's had to work his way into uh, you know having access to the right kind of tools and the access to build stuff. And he's always that's made him improvise to use just every yeah. modern materials to yeah. make his stuff that he needs. And you're missing a lot of that, I think, with which this leads version. to other problems because he, you know, as an adult, he's having to work for corporations. That are you know doing scientific knows, corporations, yeah. but he's having to work. And one of them, he's got um, Morpheus mm-hmm. or Morbius, I mean, um, chained up in the basement of the complex yeah. because he doesn't have any place else to take him. You know, those are the the kinds of problems that, as Matt stated, his economic situation dictates yeah. because he doesn't have access to that stuff having him have access to tony stark's wealth and yeah in suits kind of deflates that a little yeah bit. i think that was a good way to explain the story in a non-spider-man movie uh, yeah. like we don't have time to tell you about spider-man and the avengers film so and and then they just never did really in, in his own movie i'm okay it, that we didn't get another or yeah i didn't story. need that i don't but, need that but yeah I, but well, was, him being who he is it needs to be a part of the story. Yeah. What was really, I absolutely loved when he showed up in Civil War. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that he was keeping up with everybody in Civil War being a kid in basically pajamas. Right. You know, he didn't have the super, you know, he didn't have the the technology that so many other characters had that they were using he didn't have the uh, super soldier serum or the military training. Yeah. He's just a kid. And that's the way he was portrayed, you know. And uh, oh, and his one liners in that, I think, were, were amazing. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And well, it just. And, and yeah. then to make him all sad and upset because Tony's going to take his toys away in the first Spider Man movie was really bothersome to me. Yeah. Like, if you'd taken Tony Stark out of the first movie, mm-hmm. it's a much better movie to me. Yeah. The, 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 so the overall you know the um base of the appeal of the character seems to have been taken out of the new mcu version where it was there in the sam Raimi version yeah it's been taken out in this version again it's not that they're bad <clears throat> movies right they're no not, they're good movies yeah. it's just that they've changed the character enough that some of us old enthusiasts you know get off of our lawn but it's it's part of who the character is right. well it's it's the reason the character is like arguably the most recognizable Marvel character on the market. He's, he's got human problems. And, you know, it's just, it's setting him apart from the the that's superhero right. universe, whether it's Marvel or DC at the that's time. Right. That's what made him such a unique character. And so relatable are all these things. And all those things have been taken away <clears throat> in this new version. Yep. Uh, you know, and it's still, and it, it's still, it's just a shame when these kind of things happen, when, you have decades upon decades of character attributes that have made the character popular to where there can be a movie version yeah. and all of those things are taken away. It's just, it's like, why do these things continue to happen? Well, I mean, they even <clears> address <throat> it in one of the Avengers books is his poverty level because he's like, he's broke and yeah. they, all the Avengers know it. And they're like, Tony will write you a check. You work for the Avengers. And he's like, <clears throat> yeah, but then I have to give my identity. Right. He won't even, he won't give his identity to the closest people yeah. because he's got to protect Aunt May. Well, and his, his and, innocence and, yeah. You know, the character in the comic books, his, his innocence has always been something that's, again, set him apart. And one of my favorite moments in comics, 
specifically Spider-Man is when it was during the, um, his Avengers run. And of course this is also, you know, the Avengers makeup of it's, it's Spider-Man, it's Wolverine. Mm-hmm. It's <clears throat> well, in one of these storylines, Wolverine has to tell the rest of the Avengers that he has a son. So, you know, he's, he's explaining, you know, how, how, uh, Dakin or Dawkin <laughs> came to be. And he's telling the team that with a sense of shame and everybody's quiet except Spider-Man in the back goes, you've had sex. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the best Spider-Man moments to me. There, there's some, there's some great interaction. I think that may have been the Bendis run on um, Avengers. Like, I think it was, but I'm not sure. That was some of uh, Bendis's best work was when he was on Avengers yeah. and, and Ultimate Spider-Man. That was when, uh, you know, I really became a Bendis fan before he ruined it for me again later. <laughs> <laughs> before he ruined it. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, well, that's a good I, segue. So what are some of your, what are some of your favorite Spider-Man stories? I mean, so Spider-Man, like, I, you know, I did a little a little Google foo research, um, before the show, um, Spidey has been in approximately 15,890 issues yeah. since the beginning of, uh, uh, since he was created. Um, yeah. you should read every one of those issues. I, I'm going to pass <laughs> on that, but I've tried to read some of the good ones. Um, and you know, I mean, if you're talking about reading all of his solo issues, shout out to our boy Arnie, who just like locked it in <coughs> and now has a complete, run of spider-man it's impressive um it, from expensive af-15 all the way to current mm. so yeah um Jeez. it's been a lifelong endeavor for him so congratulations brother um but so yeah what are, what are some of your favorite spider-man stories what's, what, what's go ahead so i have two questions along okay. those lines so what's the first spider-man story you read oh, wow. and what do you think's the best okay um Jeez, the first one. And you may not remember the first one. I I don't know that I remember the first one, to be honest. Do you remember how you were exposed to the character first? I was exposed to the character from the 1970s cartoon. He had a trench coat. He opened it up. (laughs) The friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. 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 Yeah. That's how I was exposed. That and Electric Company. Yep. Do you remember Electric Company? Yep. Mm-hmm. So I don't. So Electric Company was a show that was on. It wasn't on when he. Yeah. Was it. So it was on PBS. It mm-hmm. was on like around Sesame Street. Came on after in the morning or whatever mm-hmm. for kids. And they did about once every five or six, maybe once a week, did a segment with Spider Man. Now it it was drawn like it was in a cart in a comic book, and it would like whoop whoop and and move the panels and stuff and. It was never real action oriented. It was usually him sitting around talking. He might shoot a web or something. But I watched Electric Company just to see the Spider Man. So the reason any child did. Yeah, I mean, probably. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> but yeah, I. So that was those were my first exposures. Yeah. Back in the seventies, there was also a really bad Spider Man movie that I remember seeing. Um, but, yeah, that was my first exposure. And then later, of course, into the comics. And then I went back and read some of the old stuff. So, so same with the 70s cartoon. Yeah. Um, what's interesting to me about that is how universally appealing Spider-Man is to children, mm-hmm. specifically little boys. Everybody mm-hmm. I know that has a young child that's a little boy goes through a Spider-Man phase. Yep. It's really fascinating to me that that, ha- that happens. If, he has, if they have any exposure to Spider-Man. They love they him. Be. It's crazy. I had it, too. I had yeah. Spider-Man shirts. I had a Spider-Man piggy bank. I had a posable Spider-Man figure that you put on the wall when mm-hmm. I was a kid. And uh, my mother destroyed it in a fit of rage, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Did I you have, destroy your mom in a fit I, of rage? I, I may have had something to do with that Hang rage. on, Matt. Get on the couch. Let's talk <laughs> yeah. about this. You know, <laughs> we, I think I we, just, have, we found something here. You know, I love to remind her of how much those things would be worth if she hadn't destroyed it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I was a just adored Spider-Man yeah. as a kid. And so did my nephews, you know, yep. f- 35 years later. Yeah. This the universal appeal I think of the it's characters. The comedy, the, fascinating, the to me. wisecracking. Uh, it's all of it's that. Some, I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. It's some. It's yeah. It's incredible. And you know something else that's interesting about the character to me when it was designed. This was the first American comic book character 
superhero, mm -hmm. that face was totally covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this mask completely covered his face. That that's also really interesting to me. That happened, and not to mention it's Spider Man. Well, that, spiders are not pe appealing things. These are, you know, he named this character Spider Man. It just everything spells that this should not have been a success. Well, he talked about that yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, that you know, Stan Lee did. Yeah, yeah, Stan Lee when he went to Marvel because you know he wasn't in charge of Marvel at the time, and he said, "I want to make this character Spider Man." You can't name a character after an insect, or right. you know. And he's like, "Oh, but just, just but people hate spiders. Shot. Yeah, people you know. hate spiders. You can't do this." And yeah. He's like, ah, well, let's just give it a shot and see. And talked him into putting a story in Amazing Fantasy. And it was the best-selling Amazing Fantasy ever because yep. of that. And actually ended Amazing Fantasy and started Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Amazing Spider-Man. So um, you didn't answer. What was your first exposure? So I was trying to think. Um, I think probably a lot like y'all, the first time I remember like knowing that Spider-Man was a thing was it had to do with the cartoon. Now, my childhood being in the early 90s, I don't remember if it was the actual Spider-Man cartoon or if it was the episode of the X-Men cartoon where Spider-Man swung in there. I, I forget which episode that was, but there was one. Anyway, that's the first time I remember seeing him like on a screen. But the first comic book I ever had from Spider-Man was actually a Pizza Hut comic book. Yeah, mm, um, there were. was a There was this line where Pizza Hut, they had an X-Men comic book, they did a Spider-Man comic book. I forget which and other they ones were, they, they did. They did reprints of old comics yeah. and put them out as... And I want to say it was the McFarlane era Spider-Man. Probably, I'm not I don't know. If it was the '90s, then yeah, yeah, chances are it was. Um, but that was, yeah, that was the first Spider-Man comic I ever ever owned, and that's the first time I saw him. And then again, so you know, my, my parents weren't as a kid were not huge into me reading comics. They weren't really huge into like just because it was we didn't spend money. We we grew up broke. We didn't spend money on things that we didn't need to spend money on. But every once in a while, we would go. Um, I forget. To a, to a restaurant somewhere, probably, you know, not in the vault, not where I grew up, but at somewhere else in Delta, and they had one of these little gumball machine things, but instead of it giving you, like, a little package um, with a toy or whatever in it, you could get a pack of trading cards, so you put in, like, 50, 50 cents, and you turned it, and it fed you a pack of trading cards, and I always got the Marvel trading cards, and I kept, I, I kept these things for years, but I got, you know, in these were several um, Spider-Man, you know, you had, you had Amazing Spider-Man, you had, uh, you know, just all of the different verbs of spider-man um, that, that's probably and goes to what you said about why kids are so fascinated marvel knows what they have and they mm -hmm. market that character exceptionally well to kids i feel like you know there's always spider-man toys you can go in there into the uh, walmart or target yeah. or a toy store you're always going to find a batman and a spider-man toy what i think my generation especially is where they they kind of started realizing hey we don't and, and for better or worse i'm not i'm not making a judgment call on it um they didn't need comic books to make kids love these characters especially characters like spider-man because i had spider-man toys i like like matt said i'm sure i had a spider-man backpack i knew who peter parker was i like i would buy the vhs tapes um, but I didn't need to go collect the comic book to get the feel of Spider-Man because uh, he was just kind of it, it's the same with Batman too. I think he's just kind of this pop culture symbol now that we all know him, and kids can can just do what they want because they have access to 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 him. I think that may be what's missing in today's day and age. Yes, we have these movies that are made for, and I'm not even talking about the MCU, the animated movies, right? But there's not really any ongoing cartoons that are these characters right now you know you guys had uh, batman the animated series and and the, the x-men cartoon which drew kids into comic yeah. books and we all just talked about how our first experience with spider-man was an animated cartoon mm -hmm. as a kid and here we are you know some of us 45 years later talking about that cartoon and that's probably what got me to where i'm at now with comic books to be honest you know yeah yeah it, it's you know something else that's interesting about spider-man com and comparable to batman is his rogues gallery yeah, yeah. i mean he's got More like the flash's rogues gallery i mean he's got arguably the best rogues gallery yeah, I, in in comics next to batman certainly in marvel he's got the yeah. best in my opinion yeah um and then you've got Batman and Flash in, in DC that would be as, you know, the closest comparable, and probably Batman would. Mm -hmm. I think the, Batman's the most comparable. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so you don't remember the first Spider-Man comic you bought? I really, honestly, don't. Um, I know, other than the other than the, the 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 Pizza Hut version, I know some of the early comic books I had. Uh, I think was in the middle of like the Madam Web, the Spectacular Spider-Man. There was mm-hmm. an issue of that that I got randomly. There was a hollow foil. Um, version I think that I still have uh, it wasn't of course there was. it wasn't like Spider-Man 300 or anything but there was uh, some like hollow foil version and of course you know these things caught my eye as a kid when I when, when I did start collecting comics the comics that I brought home which were not many were Avengers and then I tried to bring home the darkness and my mother saw that and promptly came into that <laughs> um, no, 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 her, her son would not be looking at these scantily clad women in his, her books she regrets that now today though <laughs> would, would but she could only you'd let me read the darkness mom <laughs> See? it's your fault mom <laughs> I mean, I was looking at just Jackie Estacado anyway, but so, um, but yeah. So that was the books I was bringing home. So I, mine was just more like a piecemeal of mm. random. Like I would go buy those. You remember those three packs that they would sell at like yeah. Walden Books oh, or yeah. some place yep. like that. I would go buy a three pack random comic oh, yeah. of Spider Man in those. So that was most of what I had. Well, what was your first comic? Oh, he Spider Man versus Wolverine. Yeah, of course that's the one you got. Right, it's because it was Wolverine. Yeah, when right? I was a kid, I was a Wolverine fanatic. Yep, not much has changed. And uh, wearing the shirt, <laughs> I bought this off the wall at the local comic book shop. Um, I had a gift certificate. I got a gift certificate as a child for Christmas, and I bought this off the wall because I was fascinated as a kid. I was like, "Why would Spider Man fight? Why would they fight?" Right. Um, so. <laughs> I remember. Did they team up at the end to take I, on a bad guy? Mm, eh. yeah. So <laughs> I vividly it, remember right? buying this book, and it was like at the time this was the, you know, the thickest book I'd ever right. bought. It's like a double sized issue. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I'll I'll be reading this forever. <laughs> I sat down. I was like, <laughs> I got to br- clear out. Here you week. are just sucking in this this awesome awesome thirty years book. later, and you still have it. Yeah. So it was. So the, the, it, this is it's somewhat interesting as well. So I'll, this is from 1987. It says number one, but this is a one shot. Mm-hmm. Marvel used to do that, call their number ones one shot. But anyway, yeah. so the credits on this, written by James C. Owsley, uh, art by Mark Bright. James C. Owsley, does that name ring a bell? No. No, it doesn't. Uh, because he changed his name to Christopher Priest. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Not and there's no explanation for that. I did some research to why. No Can't explanation to why he changed his name to Christopher Priest. Oh, huh. Yeah. The only thing people can figure out is at one point he referenced, "Well, if so and so ever happens, I'll become a priest." Well, so I'm like, well, I guess that happened then. Nobody can. Yeah. So anyway, a, a very young Christopher C- Priest wrote this wow. story. And something else that's, that was interesting that's just cemented in my mind as a child when I read this. And I probably read this when I was around 10 years old. Spider-Man kills a woman in this. Oh, really? She now, she commits suicide by Spider-Man. Right. It's like suicide by cop. Um, of course, and it takes place in Berlin. There's a lot of references to the Berlin Wall. And as a kid, I I was like, what the, what? Right. What's going on with this? Why are they in Berlin? Who are these people? <laughs> and then, you know, Spider-Man uh, accidentally kills a woman. And I was just like, this blew my mind as a child. Uh, interestingly enough, a year or two ago, that was referenced in somebody's run. Really? Yeah, because I read it and I'm like, pow. I mean, it was like a flashback reading that when he referenced this story in the in a, one of the Spider-Man stories that came out within the last year. And I do not recall which one it was. I just, are you reading the main main Spider-Man? Now? No, uh, no, it's not that one. I think it might have been Life Story. I was going to say Zordowski's Life Story. It might have been Life Story. I remember story. that, yeah. And, um, but yeah, so that, that one is the, that was the first Spider-Man book that I read. Of course... You know, then later in the uh, Spider-Man, the 90s cartoon, you know, I was watching that one as well. Yeah. Wolverine makes a, an appearance. And, of course, they, they get into it there. And uh, What? Spider-Man and Wolverine fight? Yeah, they, they get into it. Wolverine called I him love- a pencil neck little geek. <laughs> and I was eating it up as a kid, man. Um, what are some of your favorite stories from Spider-Man? Ah, uh, so... <laughs> I don't know if it's my, it's hard to say, but the standout, and maybe I do have to admit that it's my favorite, 
Um, Craven's Last Hunt. Craven's Last Hunt is just bizarre with yeah. a capital B. Um, I guess you guys have read. Yeah, that's, that's my that's my favorite Spider Man story. I mean, and it's arguably a Craven story. Yeah. yeah, you know, that is the strangest freaking Spider Man story. It's it's incredible to me that that got past editorial. I did some research on Craven's Last Hunt. Originally, that was not a Spider Man story. That was a rejected Batman story. And uh, the only, sense. only reason it got rejected is because Killing Joke was in development at the time. Yeah, and yeah, DC okay. told. Uh, Mateus, sorry, this is too yeah, much we, like the Killing Joke. Wow. Alan Moore's working on. So they took it and put it in. So he changed it up, you know, and he repitched it a few different times. And finally, as a Spider-Man story, it got it got accepted. But um, for those of you that have not read Craven's Last Hunt, I highly recommend it. It's unlike yeah. any other Spider-Man story I've ever read, anyway. So, so you said it's, and and I agree with you about everything. But you said it's it's really a Craven story, and and it is. But I think it's still a Spider-Man story at its heart because you see who Spider-Man is by putting somebody else in his clothes, somebody who you know who sees it as I well, just need to. Craven's be the best. got more screen time in that story than anybody. Right, is right. what I mean. Yeah, no, I mean no, you're reading about yeah. Craven in that. Right. You know. You are, but what I'm saying is the absence. Like you're putting, you know, Craven takes the black suit, and Craven goes out and he does all of these things because you know he his goal was to to be better than Spider-Man and to, you know, to get rid of the vermin, which is the person that Spider-Man could never beat, beat on his own. Um, and, and he's successful at that. It, but, but you learn a lot about Spider-Man by showing who Spider-Man isn't, but because Craven doesn't realize what make kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Craven doesn't realize what makes Spider-Man so special. Craven doesn't realize the heart that goes into being Spider-Man. He just thinks of it as being this apex alpha predator thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not who Spider-Man is. He doesn't, he doesn't respect life in the way that Pete respects life. And so you, you, yes, he gets more, more screen time and it, it is a, it is a Craven story and you learn a lot about Craven in it too. But in doing so, it is a roundabout way of showing you what what is the most special about Pete in that suit and how nobody else but Pete um, could be that person uh, and what Spider-Man really is not about. And, you, you know, the, like you see those kind of stories uh, in other places as, as well, but I think it really goes to show just how people can can misconceive these characters. And I think that was part of the point that he was making is, is you know, kind of like people have a misconception about the Punisher. Craven had this huge misconception about what Spider-Man was and what he should be, um, and and in doing so, you just see the magic of 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 the of the genetic makeup or the literary genetics of of this character that is young and has a heart and and knows struggle and knows to put people above himself, um, and that's what I think makes that story so special. And then the end of it, which again, the, you know, what Craven does to himself at the I, end of so, it, yeah, I, I, I just kind of just blew his mind too um <laughs> it's crazy i'm reading that i'm like it's just amazing it got past editorial yeah. it really is so some of my favorite stories are the ones where peter loses his mind like you push him too far yeah. and you see what he's actually capable of and the one that always comes to my mind is back in black which is a post-civil war after and it's the reason he goes to mephisto and makes the deal but he uh his unmasked during civil war took a side and then switched sides because he mm -hmm. realized he was on the wrong side. He took a side unmasked. Now everybody knows who he is and they kill Aunt May. Kingpin kills Aunt May or has her killed and Peter loses it. And, you know, he puts on the black suit, which is not a good sign for anybody. Right. And he just, you know, he's tearing apart New York, trying to find out who it was, literally breaks into prison to threaten Kingpin and comes just an inch within killing Kingpin and, you know, just mm -hmm. backs off right at the last second. But it was, you know, one of the darkest Batman stories and it was being told. Except across... it was Spider-Man. What did I say? You said darkest Batman stories. but Yeah, yeah. darkest spider-man stories right. i've read um but you know it leads to one of the worst is, segments of spider-man which is the brand new day and right new day which i hated but yeah um it was it was so good and i was so disappointed with them going that route where he goes to mephisto and 
and gets Aunt May brought back and no one can remember who he is and all of that sort of stuff. And, and ultimately it's Mary Jane that makes the deal, but it's still Peter would never go to the devil and make a deal. Right. You know, so that to me was bothersome, but, um, so if I look past Craven's last hunt, which is, you know, like I, I, Mike Zeck's work on that book, his, his inks on that book are just top notch. I, I love everything about that book. I, I have the hardcover. I, I think I'm two issues, like two of the floppies away from just having all six of those mm. issues because they, they were they were sent out in two issues across the board. But so if I look past that, I still think my favorite um, come in the, the original Ditko stories where he they're getting the, the Sinister Six together. And throughout that story, you know, they keep throwing uh, keep they keep throwing Pete curveballs um, and he doesn't know how. And I think part of why is that that is you know, it's Early Ditko and Stan, or you know, that's them lacing together this character who who changed a number of times, but but that that core is still there. Um, but that's also some of my favorite villains, and you see him for the first time face like an enemy on multi fronts. Um, and of course, you get that moment to where at the end of that run, um, you know, he's having to I think it's issue thirty eight where he's having to push up, um, and he's got this giant pillar on the back of him, and you know. It, He's not using his web shooters. He's not using any of the technology. It's just him, like, as a kid, refusing to quit, refusing to give up against all odds and having you. I mean, yes, he's got his radioactive spider powers, but it, it, it's something that is the most human and the most indelible part of Spider-Man, which is his refusal to stop. Um, well, and, it's, and him overcoming his uh, self-doubt. Right. And, right. and Well, and you can read that, too, as this kind of, like, bootstrap mentality, which... I think it's fair to say that Ditko was fairly prone to, and that was part of the message he was trying to send in his story. Um, but, the, you know, if you read other Ditko stories, he battles back against that. But he did these pages, um, these splash pages in, in those issues of Spidey fighting each of the each of the Sinister Six I, will always be, hands down, my favorite pages of any Spider-Man stories because they're just pinups. They're, you know, him fighting Dr. Octopus in, in this, like, vat um, him and Craven and the cats, like those pinups are some of my favorite work. And it's just some of the most beautiful, beautiful pieces of Spider-Man art. So, um, yeah, that would be my favorite. It's, it's, is those, the last half of, of Ditko's run on the work. It's, you know, and he's, um, Spider-Man, the first, you know, several issues of Spider-Man that set up all this. It's just one of the few times that if you go back and look at it, None of that's had to be changed. None right. of that's had to be like retrofitted or right. the character really has, you know, great example of this is Batman. The original iteration of Batman, he had guns. Right. You know, well, that's been, you know, that's obviously been changed and the core part of the character is he doesn't believe in guns. Nothing about Spider-Man as, that I can think of has had to, you know, they've had to uh, to retro change. They haven't. I mean, it, the launch was perfect. The launch of the character was perfect perfect yeah he he is at the core still the same character today yeah. well he should be that he in the comics anyways yeah. mm-hmm. well i haven't read any of the new stuff for a while i think of, i think the core is still there yeah. i mean so like i think with these characters it's even with batman or even with these other characters who've been changed dozens and dozens of times i i still think you know i still think the core of that character is still there like they they may have changed a little bit but um you know, when I think about Reed Richards and Sue, I still think the core of those characters are still there. Well, I think Marvel, um, it's a little different because some of the DC characters started so yeah. long before. Well, Wonder Woman is not. Wonder Woman's not the same character she originally started out to be. I, you know, they've changed some things about her, but Superman's not. Superman's not. Um, and that's, and I'm not saying that's bad. I just think it's yeah. it's I mean, somewhat unique these, for yeah, that to the that the launch to be perfect. For, for him, I think the, the motivation of, of how I became me is always because I let my uncle's killer run past me. Um, I think that's like that is that is almost they, they never need to change that. And I don't know that they ever, ever have or will, because that's that's almost the perfect motivation. Well, and um, that's the other compelling part about Spider-Man is that, you know, when you talk about characters that have stayed dead, it's Uncle Ben and Gwen Stacy. Now they brought yeah. Gwen Stacy back through a multiversal way, but that's not the Gwen Stacy from that universe it's a different Gwen Stacy um but the when Peter has a loss that profoundly affects him it doesn't come back until they got to Aunt May and they decided to bring her back yeah now now why he didn't make the deal and bring back Uncle Ben at the same time it was just Aunt May 
You know who I feel bad for? <laughs> Betty Brandt. <laughs> Betty got screwed over. No, no. So <laughs> you go back and you reread that. Betty Brandt was um, a bit of a pedophile. He was in high school and she worked at the at the uh, Daily Bugle and they were dating. That's right. She wasn't a student, was she? No. I was, I've always thought she, she was, was a, a college graduate and she okay. was <laughs> she was dating a high schooler. It, it was a little amazing cringy. fantasy indeed. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little cringy if you go back and read their I don't think now, I ever... granted their their romance didn't last long. Yeah. Because she she felt granted. That, <laughs> Yeah, Didn't she end up going better. for like Flash? Or? She left for a while yeah. because she found out that um, she found out who Peter was and that it yeah. was just too dangerous. So she left. She moved out of state and then came back later and he was involved with Gwen. Somebody more age appropriate right. for him. <laughs> so here's here's my question. Are y'all team Gwen or y'all team MJ? MJ. Team MJ? MJ. I think I'm team Gwen. Um, I love Gwen Stacy. I sure. love the character, yeah. and I love what happened. I, I mean, I don't love her death, but I love the <laughs> the story is interesting and in how it affects for Green Goblin. There. No, well, it, it affects who Peter Parker yeah, is no. forever from that point on. So, but MJ's obviously his soulmate, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, I mean. And her entrance is still one of the best in comics. Yeah. He's, I mean, definitely the longest relationship he's had. Uh, the what? It's definitely the longest relationship he's had. Um, well, I mean, he had to rebuild it after yeah. Brand New Day. So Yeah. I think I'm Team Gwen, though. I always, like, I always like that dynamic. And like you said, I think it's because because of how much of an impact it had on him and, and, and those forms of comics. I love that they went that way in the the second series of comic or the movies with uh, Andrew Garfield, that it was Gwen Stacy because Mm -hmm. that was more appropriate for the era they were doing those movies. Um, And I mean, they gave us her death on screen. So um, that was hard. That was hard to watch on screen. I mean, so it's been a long run. He he is an incredibly uh, compelling character um, all throughout Uh, some of the, some of the, the back matter in books like the, the Spider-Man omnibuses I have where they talk about, they talk with some of the creators that have had long runs on him and helped craft him. Um, and then th- that that's really helped frame the way that I think about Spider-Man. Um, and then our buddy, um, our buddy Zach's, uh, Zach's book, um, the no, uh, the mysterious travelers where he, he was focusing specifically on Ditko, but talking about characters like Dr. Strange and Spider-Man and which, by the way, I know we were talking about we don't like the buddy buddy, um, you know, the mentor. Spider Man's always got to have a, a big brother around him. But I love in this movie that they're doing two of Steve Ditko's most prominent characters. Um, that it is it is Doctor Strange and Spider Man, and how similar yet how different those characters are in their comic book makeup. Um, I hope we see a lot of that um, played out uh, because the, even though they are so different in their in their profiles very similar themes went into making up those characters. Um, and Zach Crusay's book, uh, Mysterious Travelers, really plays in, like talks about some of that and, and some of these, this political mindset that um, Steve Ditko is in and help, helping craft these. I haven't thought about it, but at first glance, they're completely polar opposite in yeah. who their characters are. Uh, mm-hmm. Without sitting here and thinking about it for a while, but you, you know, one's arrogant and one's humble. So just in that... yeah since they're completely polar opposites but. Mm-hmm. well there, there's that but it's also they're, they're both inward characters and depending on the way because so, yes dr strange does look into the the multiverse but most of his stuff is is interiority like it's going and figuring out there's some like personal lesson he has to learn Obviously, interiority yeah just making sure i heard that right yeah it's just it's the interiority <laughs> of the self um they and him going into these nether zones um it's always something that they're learning about themselves uh as versus other people who are always pushing out pushing outward um i think mm-hmm. that's a really interesting uh way to think about these characters and and mm-hmm. there's a lot of you know i would have to old man i haven't read that book yet um to see but to me it seems like they're completely 
into well, no, I think I th- completely opposite. Well, but I get what you're older, saying. One's yeah. younger. I think it's in the like if you look at the complexities of the world that they're in and what they're trying to achieve and strive to do. Um, both of them, um, both of them come for like they're for you, the the first thing that Doctor Strange did. He 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 adapted magic because he was crippled uh, because of his hands, and he wanted uh, you know there was a revenge factor there and payback. It was very like you said he was very arrogant in what he was doing. Spider-Man, his driving force was the fact that he reached a certain level um, in, in his powers, and he thought that there was no, like, he was arrogant as well, and it led to his uncle getting destroyed um, in, in those things. So there's some of that, like, this broad kind of uh, idea of, of personal politics, where you want to call it, like, neo-libertarianism or something like that, that Steve Ditko has written into these characters. He's written into, uh, you know, his characters that he did at, at DC, Blue Beetle, um, you can see a lot of that kind of same same construction. Um, but if, if you want, like I'm going there because if we're talking about Spider-Man and the makeup and we're talking about Steve Ditko, just go check out Zach Krusey's book. It's called yeah. um, Strain- Mysterious Travelers. Um, it, it's it's a really, really great read, especially if you like like academic writing on, on literature and comics. So um, it's fun stuff, man. I cannot... And who does it? <laughs> I, I do, yeah, yeah. Let me wave my little freak flag. Um, published by Mississippi, Mississippi Press, um, University of Mississippi Press. Um, dude, I cannot. I, I can't wait to see the movie. I'm, oh yeah, I'm really yeah. It, it. it looks really good, and I, of course, I'm interested to see how it's going to affect. You can't have introduced the multiverse and not have it affect yeah. the MCU and right. everything that comes after Level it. Level so. of curiosity is way up with this i can't wait till we have incursions and namor destroys earth because no one has the guts to do it god i can't wait to see namor do you think you think we're gonna i mean so i know this is stupid and it's one of those conversations but like do you think we're gonna see the fantastic four in this or in, in the this next movie com- no coming up i think they're gonna be introduced in their own way yeah everybody like the internet doing the internet thing losing their mind about oh this is mephisto and that's mephisto i'm like i don't give a shit about mephisto I want to see the Fantastic Four. I, like, yeah, show I'm, me Namor. Like we know he exists in the world. Like I want to see those folks. I mean the the rumor is Luke Evans was hired to play uh, Namor. So. I'm fine with that. He looks just like him. Yeah. So. I'm I'm good with that. I mean he may so. have to shave his little mustache thing, but eh. I mean there's there's bearded Namor in the comics. <laughs> Is that the evil Namor? Is that when we know he's evil is when he's got the good <laughs> He just kind of twirls it. <laughs> Star Trek Uses evil. his pitchfork to like spin it around. Um, no, so. Well, all right. Um, that's that's a little Spider-Man power hour for y'all. Um, that was fun. Power hour. Glad power we, hour. Glad we did that. Um, well, I, one thing we didn't talk about, any any of your favorite Spider-Man artists? Um, or do you have a favorite Spider-Man? I mean, mine's Ditko. I mean, that's, that's going to be mine. Like, Romita. Yeah. Uh, in the McFarlane, you have to give him credit for some of the things that he did in there, um, regardless oh, yeah. of how you feel about McFarlane. Um, he changed the way the webbing was drawn. Yep. He, or he changed the way the character was drawn. Yeah. Big eyes. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, his whole, the dynamic poses changed. Mm-hmm. He changed the way people drew the character from then on with, all, with the dynamic poses that he did. I'm glad they got rid of the little underwebbing thing. Oh, see, I love the underwebs. <laughs> I think those are cool. Yeah, I thought um, it was cool. Uh, especially when he's jumping off a building and gliding, I always thought that there was that was neat little. But little yeah, it's hard to net because there's so many artists have been attached. It's hard, yeah. but yeah, it did go obviously because he 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 you know cast the mold. Yeah. But um, yeah, McFarlane, you know, he really brought a lot of new uh, attention to the character and really accelerated the sales of the books. And then uh, then uh, Eric Larson, yeah. You know, had an enviable task of taking or following McFarland and actually pulled it off so well that the sales continued to climb when Eric Larson was on it. That was a good. That was a pretty smooth transition, though. Like it's it's definitely not not the same, but I, I've always felt like um, like Larson and McFarland had a similar visual style. Like I don't think that they're they're too far apart. So I felt like that was a pretty smooth. Actually, transition. like Larson's work on Do Spider-Man you? better than I like this, McFarland's. His, his panel layouts and his storytelling were superior, no doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, if and and just Mike Zach, uh, Mike Zach was great. Yeah, yeah it, again, there's a lot of great artists it, to be attached to it. It really is, but um, yeah, I go back to the classics: Dico, Ramita. Yeah. Um, even Ramita Junior. When he was on Spider Man, it was yeah, like, yeah, great Spider Man stuff. Yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, Craig? You're you're a big collector. Do you have a Spider Man piece of like Spider Man ephemera that's the closest to your heart? Um. 
Yeah, so I have a piece that was done by Rich Woodall mm-hmm. that I really like. It's a very classic uh, Spider-Man pose. Um, you know, I, I've got a few pieces, but yeah, that's that's probably the one that. Got anything in your collection that's just the? Mine was destroyed. Oh yeah, yeah. And your mom in a fit of rage. Well, mine mine is a memory. So mine a is memory. when I um yeah it's when was I got it to destroyed go to... too. No. Did his mom destroy your no. memory in no. a fit of rage? No, that's a different super villain power that she doesn't have. No, my, mine is when I got to go to Washington, D.C., and while I was there, I went to the Library of Congress, and I spent about two hours just looking at the original uh, Amazing Fantasy pages. Oh, man. Pages. Yeah. I've got them. Like, I've got a, like I, I literally recorded myself just staring at these pages for an hour. Yeah, that'd be, um, that'd be that was That's my, like, that's the dearest to my heart. I don't own any, like I said, I'm not a big Spider-Man guy, so I don't have anything in my collection that's really, you know, yeah. but it's but it's that <laughs> memory. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know how people can not be a Spider-Man or a Batman guy. It it's weird. Like we but we know them. Yeah. Seems like I don't the, dislike them by any means. No, no, no. Not, I'm just saying like flagship. people that are not at all fans of like, no, nah, I don't characters. like Spider-Man yeah. or I don't like yeah. Batman. You're like, what? <laughs> what comics are you reading? <laughs> hey, puppies too. <laughs> yeah. Sicko. Yeah. Well, all right. So uh, go check out. There's a couple of different Spider-Man books on the shelf right now uh, that you all should go uh, go check out and get caught up on your reading. Um, go check out Spider-Man Life Story. I think we spoke about it earlier. It was Zdarsky and Bagley. An annual actually came out mm-hmm. uh, last week or week before last. Um, so there's lots of good spider stuff to read. So go get caught up on your Spider-Man before you go see this new movie. Um, and you know what? Go over to our Facebook group, our Instagram page, or our Twitter, and tag us in a post. Tell us what your favorite... Spider-Man thing is tell your favorite Spider-Man story, your artist, your writer, the thing that you have in your collection that means the most to you, your memory, um, what your favorite issue was. Like, just drop a little Spider-Man appreciation post on one of our social media pages, um, and we'll 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 have fun with you. We'll get on there and comment and talk about it. Um, but other than that, we've got some books that are coming out this next week that we're going to check out that we're I think we're all really excited about. We're going to give you guys a taste of the menu for New Comic Book Day. Craig, what are you grabbing off the shelf this week, brother? Yeah, I'm I'm not actually going to pick this up, but I'm recommending that people pick it up, and I'm not picking it up because I have the tra- the floppies. Gotcha, but this gotcha, is a gotcha. trade paperback. Um, it's Joe Hill, uh, Leo Max, and Dave Stewart, and it, uh, it's from DC, the Black Label. It's Basket Full of Heads, mm-hmm. and I talked about this when it was coming out quite extensively, but this is about a young woman that gets a hold of a... Uh, viking war axe or battle axe if you will and uh in order to defend herself and she figures out as she cuts off people's heads the heads remain alive (laughs) even though the body dies so she has to deal with these heads that are still talking to her and so forth but um the reason i'm recommending this is because there's actually a new series coming out that is refrigerator full of heads by the same team so Mm -hmm. i assume it's the same axe and the same uh story you know probably not the same story not the same woman because her story was told but um should be interesting to uh pick up so if you want to jump on that new series uh Sounds this good. is a good chance to go back and get the original All i right, imagine Matt. they planned that uh, yeah i would think so <laughs> got the little whiteboard with the string yeah. stashed to it <clears throat> so mine's gonna be a surprise i bet to uh no one um <laughs> From Marvel Comics, Conan the Barbarian, number 25. This actually celebrates 300 issues of Conan the Barbarian comics. Oh, wait, Uh, I can't can't wait. I'm sure it's an anthology. So it's a collection of different creators. Uh, The current creators are on there as well, but then you'll have creators like Christopher Priest, Larry Hama, Mm -hmm. Dan Slott. Um, Some of the artists that will be on this uh, as well are going to be like Marcos Martin, um jeff shaw so i'm really looking forward to this it's going to be an oversized issue so just it's fucking my, yeah 10 pounds of conan in a five pound bag oh, t- 10 pounds of conan needs to be a good podcast name <laughs> i will tell you this is probably a anthology that, that i will read because oh Con- yes, Conan please. stories in in anthology are fine. Oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. of, of yeah. course. It's much different from the other nonsense you say about. It anthology. is. It is much different. <laughs> well, I mean, most of the old Conan stuff was basically just an anthology anyway. It's just one-shot stories right. for, that can take exactly. place in time. That's why it's not a problem. Oh, yeah, this yes, one. that's that makes all the sense. It does. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to do an anthology as an annual, and <laughs> Matt's going to explain. They're going to do an anthology in the middle of a. <laughs> Freaking run. I'm just going to say it. It pisses me off that it's issue number 25 and they're going to stop the story they're telling to put an anthology book. 
They might. They've done that before. Well, cannot imagine have, a more justifiable reason to be the pissed. First eight they're going to have three story. or four pages of the continuing story. Hates it. All right. I so, do hate it. Hate. I hate it. <laughs> I, I'm also going to suggest a Marvel book. With a I, passion. <laughs> I think people should go check out Defenders number two. It's number two of five. Um, I, I loved the, the first issue, especially the... I don't know. It was just fun. I am a Defenders fan. Um, so the Defenders find themselves the birthplace of Galactus, but the Devourer is not the man they remember. Um, this is by Al Ewing and Javier Rodriguez. Um, it's going to be fun. Like I said, if you read the first issue and if you read Marvel 1000, um, you know kind of what's happening here. Um, some of the same people that you would expect to see in a Defenders book, like Doctor Strange and the Silver Surfer, um, but you also have people that you you know you know from other stuff Al Ewing has written, like the the Harpy is in this, and you have this like cloud figure, and you also have the the yeah, Masked Rider. Cloud figure. That, that's what I don't know who they are. They are they're just a cloud. They're just this like cloud. Some like, green stuff. Now you got me. Yeah. Um, so it's but it's 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 great. Uh, I really enjoyed the first issue. Um, so yeah, go check out those and more. And like I said, while you're at it, swing by and uh, add yourself to our Facebook page if you have not already done so. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We're at SFG Podcast on both of those. If you got any questions, comments, or concerns, maybe you want to email us about your favorite Spider-Man stuff or your your thoughts about what what's going to happen in this film or anything else, shoot us off an email. We're Southern Fried Geekery at Gmail dot com. We would love to hear from you. Um, and if nothing further, guys, uh, you know we all have busy weeks ahead of us. So uh, enjoy your Labor Day weekend. Have fun. Be safe. And go forth and read, love some comics. And also appreciate the interiority. And have a cup of cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs>